AI right now is like the excitement that we all had many, many years ago when HTML came out. Because now the the newer version of ChatGPT, they have a beta uh, plugins. That's like the next thing with ChatGPT. Plugins that will actually push and pull out of ChatGPT. So you can actually have an action inside of your Sana or your ClickUp and it'll push an action and actually go to ChatGPT, write something or, or get something from it, extract it, pull it back in to the system, create the work or the job description or the task for you, and then push it to a, a client or like this is act actively happening right this second. Like a few people are beta testing this and it's actually happening. Like That's just like the beginning. You're on a mission and you just need more people to know about it. And whether you're brand new to marketing or a seasoned pro, we are all looking for answers to make marketing decisions with purpose. I'm Monica Pitts, a techie, crafty business owner, mom, and aerial dancer who solves communication challenges through technology. This podcast is all about digging in and going digital. I'll share my marketing know-how and business experience from almost 20 years of misadventures. I'll be your backup dancer so you can stop doubting and get moving towards marketing with purpose. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Marketing with Purpose. I'm excited today to talk about AI because I love new technologies and learning about them. Um, maybe not all new technologies, but this is one that I'm particularly interested in, and it's been a really hot topic. But as I am not an expert in AI, I had to home around and put out some feelers, and I wandered and bumped into this gentleman, Paul Pruitt. And so he's going to hang out with us today. And he is going to tell us what he knows about AI. And he's on a committee where they're learning and really like digging into AI and how it can be adapted and utilized in your business. And so I'm hoping that we can learn a thing or two from you, Paul. Um, so let's start by having you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your business adaptive marketing program. Sure. Um, Adapted Marketing Program. And, and first, thank you for uh, having me here. I'm very honored and blessed. And um, it's interesting. We're in a time right now that I think a lot of people are going to start staking the claim that they are AI experts. So this is, this is always going to be an interesting uh, time uh, when something's newly adopted like this. But um, uh, my wife and I have an online business uh, called Adapted Marketing Program, where we help online entrepreneurs market and sell their offers, uh, typically in like coaches, uh, course owners, membership owners, like people that are experts in their field that are kind of reselling their knowledge. Um, but really my my business background, we really rewound back in time. Um, I don't know if it should start when I was selling my, East, you know, my Easter candy and Halloween candy in high school, you know, or in grade school, uh, or later on when I would sell um, yard sale kits uh, in, in my local newspaper and, and like weekly magazines. Uh, people sent me checks in the mail uh, as a kid and, and, and I did really well with these yard sale kits that I created. But, uh, but really fast forward, when I, got, when I graduated high school in 92, I went right out of high school, right into real estate. Uh, I did very well in that world. Um, and several years later in 1997, I bought half ownership in the company I worked for, uh, which there were 16 of us uh, working in one office. And by the, the next following year, I bought out the previous owner 100%. And within three years, I uh, turned that company around and we had eight offices, over 200 agents, 16 employees, doing a half a billion in transactions a year, making over $8 million in, in revenue. Uh, so I went from very poor background to multimillionaire. And in 2008, I lost everything, uh, not just because of the market crash, but because I employed my entire family. And one of those people, unfortunately, was my mother who stole over $700,000 out of the company when it was doing really well. Yeah. So I went from rags to riches back again in, in 2008, 2009 and had to reinvent my life. So um, the, the long story short is I'm very blessed that I'm at the third time of building a million dollar year uh, revenue business uh, in my lifetime right now uh, with, with my wife. So I've been geeking out and talking marketing and sales uh, for my entire adult life over 31 years now. And I don't think I'll stop. So thank you for that, having me on today. <laughs> that is a fun story. I I can like very much empathize uh, with the 2008 downturn. Like I had started my business in 2005. My biggest client was a real estate company and they, and they paid 
for half of our revenue and we did everything for them. Like I took pictures of their homes. I made their flyers. I did it all. The only thing I didn't do was their website because that's, yeah. that's what my business core is, right? Website design. Yeah. Um, and then in 2008, they were like, oh, we're going to franchise and we don't need you anymore. And I'm like, well, half of my revenue just walked right on out the door. And that was like, whoa. So um, that led to some pretty good soul searching and, and me hanging out in costumes, making cold calls in, in my bathroom. <laughs> so, oh, <wow. laughs> it was fine. It was totally fine. Um, so it seems like you kind of like taken a piece of mm -hmm. your expertise in real estate and you've rolled it out and made it into this whole thing. That's your new business, which that's really admirable. Cause I bet there's a lot of people in that spot that are like, Ooh, I don't really like what I do right now, but I don't know where that next step is. Um, so before I ask you a hundred questions about AI, I just want to ask you, like, what is it that like attracted you to the idea of really forming a business around like the sales and marketing expertise that you have? Like, cause you could have done it on anything, right? It could have yeah. been for real estate, but you exactly. didn't, it was something else. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting is through the years when I, when I was an agent, uh, I get exposed very early on uh, some hot, top producing agents that were in, in the region. I, I was in a franchise system at the time as an agent, they, I was sitting in this room and the speaker was talking, I was writing all the notes because brand new, I was right out of high school, writing all these notes. And the, the speaker kept referencing these two or three uh, top producing agents that were sitting in the, in the room. And then afterwards, I, was, I didn't know any different. I went up to one of those individuals, uh, his name is Larry, I can remember to this day, uh, and asked, like, can I take you out to lunch? Because if she's pointing at you the entire time, you know, I need to know like what you know type thing. And because uh, success is modeled, right? And yeah. we, a lot of us are reinventing the wheel all the time, but like success is already, the tracks are already laid out there. So this gentleman is really impressed, but he told me, me, he's like, look, everything you learned in this workshop, don't follow that lady. I'll, I'll tell you where, where to go to get your information. And I thought that was really funny because uh, she was using him as a, as a testimony, as an example. But um, so I very luckily got into a group of people that were smarter than me right out the get go. And that's something that I learned very early on is put yourself in a room that you're uncomfortable with invest in yourself before you're ready, because mm -hmm. then you'll rise to that, the, the equal level of everybody that's in that room. Now I've done that over and over again in my lifetime. And I was very blessed that the franchise system that I uh, had offices for, I became a national trainer for them. And I used to travel around the world and teach marketing sales, positioning, branding, handling objections, presentations, those things. I've talked in front of stages of over 6,000 people. Um, so I was already doing that like in my office. And then I was doing it for other brokers and agents, you know, around the world. And then when I lost everything and had to reinvent myself and, and slowly moving to other opportunities, I, I found myself, no matter what I dabbled in, I was always wanting to coach and teach because a lot of us know our craft really well. We're an expert at the thing we do. We're typically not a marketing expert. We're typically not a positioning or branding expert. We, we like, that's all techno babble. Like we know our thing really well. And we think like people should just know that we're really good and they should just come to us. Right. But we don't live in a field or dreams world. You know, like if you build it, they will not come. So it's just something that we have to go out into the world and we have to purposely create the messaging and the marketing to create desires so that people choose us. Cause it's very technology, good or bad. It's created a saturated marketplace in every market. And if you're not doing something to stand out, especially in the social media influencer world these days, then really you're just blending in with the crowd. You're, you're like a, you're like water on a store shelf and you, you're just looked at as a commodity and really you have to look at branding, positioning, messaging to really separate you from everyone else. So I've been doing this for that many years. So when I came into the online space and saw that a lot of people were, you know, leaning into the information, you know, selling of information, like knowledge, transference of knowledge, uh, I, I really leaned into that because I was naturally doing it with my own agents, with other agents and brokers, and at least those few industries, as, as I'm sure you know, like, they're really good at sales and not with your company and stuff. Like they probably weren't good as marketers, uh, but just, I got exposed to all of these things just by being in the right rooms early on. And uh, even today, Melissa, Melissa and I, uh, Melissa is my wife. Uh, we belong, we, we invest over six figures a year in, in masterminds mm -hmm. to be in a room where we feel uncomfortable in, you know, so it just keeps raising us to the next level. So just been doing this over and over again. And this is just a new, the next iteration of it the last several years. Okay, so with this room that you feel yeah. uncomfortable in, I bet that there are a lot of people who feel very uncomfortable in a room where people would talk about things like AI, right? I mean, it's 
changing as fast as the internet right now, <laughs> which is, it's actually probably, I think it's evolving faster than the internet because as someone who has to keep up with the internet building websites, I'm always like, well, yeah, you know, there's no, no shortage of changes that come down like the slide every single day to us, right? But I think the AI is really just like steamrolling and picking up. So um, tell me a little bit about right now, like how are you learning about this? Um, you mentioned that you were in like a group of humans that are kind of exploring it. Tell me about it. I want to learn. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's interesting you just said what you said, because I, I think Mark Cuban recently uh, on his Twitter just said that AI right now is like the excitement that we all had many, many years ago when HTML came out. <laughs> you know, and like, but that's the infancy. Like, we were geeking out about that many, many years ago. And like, where has the internet actually come now? So, as far as the future versions, we can all like cast. Like, is it going to be like the Jetsons? Is it going to be like Terminator? You know, what's what's going to happen? The the advantages, disadvantages uh, later on. But yeah, you know, when it comes to AI, at least the the marketer groups that I'm in, um, you have that segment of early adopters uh, with with every opportunity that comes out into the world. You have the masses that typically wait in their later adopters and they want to see like, is this is a fad or if it's real, if it's going to stick. And, uh, but those of us that jump on early, typically we're the testers, the beta testers, we figure things out, the quirks and everything. But also we're normally you're, when you're earlier adopting, you, you get to leverage and kind of game the system, you know, like what, what can we do? Uh, so for instance, in, in the rooms that we're in, um, there are naturally like the, the first rung of opportunities is like copywriting, you know, it's yes. like the, the natural, like first step. It's like, oh, I can, this can streamline, uh, or at least get me away from like the blank page of like, what should I be writing about? What should I talk about? Uh, it could be blog posting, you know, it could be leveraging SEO. And, and I know that you, you guys do a lot of SEO stuff with, with your clients and, and things. So it's, so it's like, what? really how do you get away from that blank page like that's the hardest part is how do you come up with the, that initial idea and this is like having a brainstorming partner you know at your fingertips uh that you can go right into the ai uh like uh, as an example uh open ai's uh, chat gpt um to be able to go in and just simply ask a prompt which could be the equivalent of like that copywriter that you might have talked to on on the other end um but also there's so many other things uh, that you can be done that can be done. Uh, we have friends of ours that they have their team software like Asana, uh, Monday, um, ClickUp, things like that. They're creating automations where they're able to do certain processes inside of their software and zap, because now the the newer version of, of, of ChatGPT, if you are they have a beta. Uh, um, and this might be dating this, but uh, you know those that, that are on the wait list right now, they're getting access to plugins. That's like the next thing with ChatGPT. Plugins that will actually push and pull out of ChatGPT. So you can actually have an action inside of your, inside of your Asana or your ClickUp and it'll push an action and actually go to ChatGPT, write something or, or get something from it, extract it, pull it back in to the system create the work or the job description or the task for you and then push it to a, a client or, or or even like without even touching anything it, it could push a tweet out for you in the future it'll be pushing a you know a, an instagram post for you and all you did was push a you know an action inside of your click up you know and you didn't have to touch any of it like this is act actively happening right this second like a few people are beta testing this and it's actually happening like right. that's just like the beginning you know to, to think about or um there's there's some people right now not even on the business end that you can ask like suggestions like put in like your dietary uh, restrictions that you personally have ask for suggestions as far as meals and the one of the approved plugins right now that people that are that are uh, actively able to test this can push right to instacart so the ingredients wow. can be delivered to you, you know, minutes after you getting the suggestion, you don't have to click anything. It'll, Instacart will actually find the, the places in your local area that have those items. And all you have to do is click buy on your app. And, you know, you click a link in ChatGPT and then it'll pop open the app and there's your, your cart waiting for you. And you just, and then 20 minutes later, you're cooking a meal that they suggested for you. Yeah. You know, crazy. This is, just, this is just the infancy. You know, this is just the infancy. There's the obvious stuff, which is the copywriting. That's what a lot of people are geeking out about mm -hmm. right now. And um, 
But um, anything that is a duplicatable task. Can be handled that, by it. Yeah, that's, that's where the fear is of a lot. Uh, like uh, just recently, IBM announced that they're on a hiring freeze and that they're estimating about, the CEO just announced this recently, and about, they're estimating that AI will replace about 7,800 of their jobs, which is about one third of their workforce currently. Not public facing, like talking to the consumer, but anything that's repeatable tasks, things that people do that just get replicated over and over again. Yeah, so that's- Wow, I mean, here. like, think about, I mean, like, I feel so proud of myself for the way that I set up Airtable. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And those of you guys who don't know what Airtable is, it's like um, it's like an Excel spreadsheet on like steroids. Like you, but because it's not just an Excel spreadsheet, it's like a database. And if you know how to program stuff, which I do, I think like a programmer and I like, I'm like, ooh, I want it to do this now. I want it to send this email. I want this to send this calendar invite. I want it to add it to my calendar. I want it to... Um, Add it to this other sheet. I want it to push it out to uh, Facebook. I want it to create an email. It just, it does all these things. I was so proud of myself. And, but I can't even imagine the magnitude that they're doing it at IBM. And I guess that is kind of like AI, but not really. I mean, do you, do you consider AI when like, so I had to write all those emails, right? And then I, it's like subbing out information based on uh, like short codes, basically in my database. <laughs> but I don't really consider that artificial intelligence. I just consider that like an automation. So like, are people calling automations artificial intelligence um, or AI or is like, the, tell me. Yeah, I, th I, think, I? <laughs> so I, I think I think where there's that blurred line is where the automation almost has an if then and it's making a decision based on an input to then mm -hmm. make different choices, which is what we would do as a human being, you know, is that it's so, but instead of somebody filling out a form, think about like a customer support email coming in mm -hmm. and that we read it as a human being, we might have a pre-designed template just so we don't have to, you know, repeat the same thing over and over again, but still there's a human interaction that makes that decision like, oh, it's this template versus this template. Now to think that an AI can actually learn, machine learn that, decision-making part of the process mm -hmm. and, and be intuitive to, to be able to read the text of an email, know exactly the context, and then make a decision to send out that predetermined text that you have. Or if they have certain rules, they could send out a free form, you know, AI generate it like in real time, co completely custom to that person in the moment, like you would do if you weren't copy and pasting based on the context right there. So it, it is scary to think, I think if it's just purely an automation, then mm -hmm. it's like, it's, you know, the A, B or the, the you do A, then automatically B happens. Probably people will just look at and still see that as an, a, as an automation. But if there's a decision, if there's like, let me actually let the AI read this. Cause then if you think about it, then like 90% of the headaches of support, like when you create an app or when you have a company, there's always those repetitive questions. There's always mm -hmm. those repetitive conversations. That normally bogs down most companies is the repetitive tasks that happen over and over again. And that could be part of support. But to think that an AI could actually learn, like you could feed it all, think about that. You could, you could have your own AI, your own mini AI in a sense, learn all of your previous responses. You could say, my client said this in the past, this was our reply. Our client B said this, this is a reply. Our client C said this, this is a reply. You could feed it that. Mm -hmm. And now it has its own boundaries as far as your business, how you language, how you talk. So then if, a, if an email did come in in the future, it could potentially read that. And it would answer it almost like with accuracy, like 99% of how you would have, because it's based on all your previous conversations and your tonality, your inflection, like your, your standards, your beliefs, your values are all embedded in it because it's sourced from that. That could That's be great for like a support, for a sales, for frequently asked questions. Like think about how much easier it would be to find answers in a support forum if it was powered by something like AI instead of... Um, the normal search algorithm because the search algorithm is like matching up words. It can't make a decision um, the same way that the AI could make. Okay, yeah. so that makes me think that you have to be really, really smart 
to implement yeah. this in your business. So what is like the barrier of entry? It seems like there's the simple version of it, right? Like learning the prompts to use something like chat GPT to do better copywriting. But then it seems like some of the stuff that we're talking about, like that has like a barrier of entry in it. Like you, you might have to hire somebody to help you with this or no, maybe you can figure out how to do it on your own. I don't know. I don't know. You tell yeah. me. Well, this comes back to being the early adopter. So mm -hmm. those of us in the, in the mid nineties, when they were, when Netscape came out and everybody was on an AOL browser and everybody was talking about, you know, typing, being a webmaster, like there's the early adopters, like, oh, I can create my own web page and understand anchor text and, and things of that nature. Okay. It, like, so there's going to be that group of people, those of us that are out there like, oh, I see the opportunity. Here's the gold rush. I will do all the geeky things and people that have the money, but don't have the time or the energy to invest, they'll compensate individuals. So the opportunity has shifted. So those people that had certain skills in the, in the past might see themselves shifting into the new opportunities and leaning in on things that the average person, because at the end of the day, like those of, and this goes with everything in life, like the mass majority of people are not going to become prompt engineers. They're not going to become people that are creating the apps. Now there's going to be the select few of us that are going to make that investment in time, energy, effort, or create companies or businesses or opportunities. But um, years ago, in order to build a website, there was nobody you could go to. You had to figure it out many, many years ago on, on your own. And you had to do it manually. And then mm -hmm. there was these little tiny mom and pop companies that popped up in all of our areas and they would code it for you and everything. And you'd be excited you're on the World Wide Web uh, mm -hmm. at the time, you know. But now fast forward 20 years, like we don't even think about like actual coding. Mm -mm. You know, there's plugins, there's there's themes, there's different, there's companies like yourself that just do it. And we don't think about like, what are the, what's the text that makes that image show up on the screen? Yeah. So for those that are early right now, yes, it sounds complicated. If you're going to jump on the bandwagon, you probably want to get somebody that's several steps ahead of you if you don't have the time and, and space to do it. Uh, but if you're one of the ones that wants to invest, you could most likely bring a team member on, or you can hire an agency that, that would do these elements for you. Uh, there's a lot of companies out there that are hiring uh, app developers to create AI apps that tap in. See, OpenAI originally was ex like, they went from a nonprofit <laughs> research into recently because of all the opportunity that popped up, they switched into a for-profit and I, actually, Open AI is actually closed now, if you think about it. Um, yeah. So, so it's kind of the irony. But uh, they're, you know, after Microsoft started dumping billions of dollars into them, and they saw that you know, hundred million plus users like jumped on this, and they started doing the the plus pro level accounts and everything. They realized, oh, because originally they were a back end company. They were creating the API mm -hmm. so that it could be pushed out to developers, and they were just a silent back end part that was doing all the 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 real work, and they were making money on licensing the technology to developers. Mm -hmm. So really you're leaning on the developers to go out into the marketplace and say, hey, here's a way to use this. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is, is it got so popular, all the end users went right there <laughs> and started using, because like, oh, I can get cool social media posts. Oh, I can get a blog. Oh, I can write a song for my my loved one. Oh, I can do a poem really quick. Uh, and the voice of Ernest Herm Hemingway or something, like you, you have the ability to do all this fun, creative stuff. But really at the end of the day, how does AI relate to your business? Like where mm -hmm. do you want to implement? Because you don't necessarily, you don't need, for some of us, we don't want to like be the one that builds the car. We just want to buy the car and drive it. And, you know, so it's like, well, wait for these cool apps. And there's always a ton of apps that are out there right now. They're doing really cool things. I mean, way beyond copywriting stuff um, that are leveraging AI. Um, if you want, I can give you a couple of examples, um, sure. uh, that, so, um, like one, one company out there is called video, uh, sounds like video, mm -hmm. uh, but it's vid yo, uh, so V I yeah, V I D Y O dot A I. And in that case, if you have a long form video, maybe something you might've put on and did a presentation of, or you might've put it on like something like YouTube, the AI is smart enough, it'll actually look at the, you upload it to this site service, it'll look at the transcript, it'll figure out the beats and when the conversation changes, and it'll automatically convert them into smaller clips. So you can use them in reels and, and TikToks and shorts, or you can use them. So it's like, it'll automatically say, oh, here's a, this is a complete thought without you interjecting. This is a complete thought. That's a 30 second clip. And it'll, if you want the, the, transcript or the, the, you know, burned in captions, it'll do that. But it's like before we would have had to physically touch that. 
Yeah. You would have had to go in and said, okay, like this is now you have other companies like Descript uh, that uh, also do video. But like, as an example, if you're doing YouTube and, and you are talking and you um and ah a lot and you have a little tick word that you might do all the time, you can tell it to eliminate the ums and ahs or the tick word or whatever. You might say the word like, like, like a lot or something, you know, because um, a lot of, lot of us do that. And um, yeah, I'm guilty uh, as well. Uh, but what ends up happening though is the script will automatically go through your entire video, clip it, automatically like in a matter of seconds instead of you having to go in manually and find each and every one of those it'll yeah. automatically jump cut it doom, 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 each each yeah. time that would be so great uh, there you are a very articulate podcast guest i have had podcast guests that are so incredibly interesting and they and i'm listening to their story and as i'm li listening to them live i'm like yes i follow everything that you're saying and everything's great and then when i go in to edit the audio um which I did at the beginning, I don't do it anymore. I would, I'd be like, oh man, oh dear. I have to figure out how to like pull out these fragments because they were thinking out loud, reeling back, like pushing back forward. And I'm thinking, oh man, this is not nearly as easy to listen to when I can't look at their face or like have this real life conversation. Something like that would be really amazing but for <laughs> for editors like that I, I bet though that there's um well so that kind of takes me to my next thought though I feel like if we choose to use AI in our business we do need to have some level of like due diligence right so you can't yeah. just put like even at the simplest basic level right I'm gonna write a blog post you have to read it oh yeah you know um and make sure that it's right back check it um and and do if you're going to have it edit your video, you're going to have to watch it and make sure that that's the right thing, right? We can't just let it, you know. I, so one question that I have for you is, do you think that if you're using AI to write content or generate things, like let's say from a creative standpoint, like I'm a creative, I'm selling my work. Do, do I need to disclose to my clients that I'm using this as part of my process? And then the next piece of the question would be like, do you need to disclose to your audience that maybe you're using it as part of your process or does it matter as long as you're editing it and making it authentically yours? Yeah. So that's a great controversial question. Um, so it, my personal take is that we have lived in a world of ghostwriters. Uh, you know, the, the popular person that you probably follow on Twitter or some social media account that has millions of followers, that's a celebrity. They most likely hired a comedian to write all those one-liners uh, all the time. Um, Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon or whoever you, you follow in, in late night doesn't go out and say, hey, here's now in recent time, there was like writer strikes and things like that. So maybe they are going to play around and, and, and joke that they're using AI for their lamer jokes that they're doing right now, because the writers might, might, might not be writing, but, but it is something that um, at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of ghost writers. There's a lot of people that, that are doing things out there. There's a lot of, now I think that really comes back to your relationship and how you personally see, um, you know, your content and how you're sharing it. Is it really the outcome that you're promising? And does it matter how or who gets the people to that outcome? Or do you find that you're more of an artist where you feel like there's this creative license that I have to be owning my work? And it would be like an internal value belief struggle that going back and forth now, understand that in, in real time, like as, as we're talking right now, um, the, the White House just invited um, it within the last several days, it hasn't happened yet uh, as of this recording, but has invited Elon Musk and, and several uh, people from uh, Google, uh, um, like uh, Sundar, who's the, the uh, CEO of, of Google, as well as uh, teams from Microsoft to come to the White House to be able to talk and address these concerns mm -hmm. uh, in front of uh, the trademark uh, patent trademark uh, office in the US, um, they just came out with initial decisions as far as how they're treating copyright and trademark on computer generated um, work that is either written and or um, uh, visual. And so far they've kicked it out uh, that they're like, okay, human being did not create, you might've created a text prompt that caused the AI to do it, 
but the AI is not a human, so it's not productive. Like that's their initial findings. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not a lawyer, so don't hold me to the exact wording uh, of that. Like we, we definitely have to see where all these things are. But I think it really just comes down to, at least for us, like uh, when I lost everything years ago and I had to reinvent myself, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I went into is I, I, as a hobbyist, I did photography and I reinvented myself as a professional photographer for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started actually teaching, coaching and doing all the things uh, in that space. And, and um, some photographers from a creative standpoint, like they had to live with the cr image creation, like taking, you know, setting up the lighting, taking the photo and everything all the way through to the editing process all the way through. Well, I had my standards with the editing, but I didn't want to spend 10 hours a day in front of a computer screen. So I hired out because we got the result. We got the end result. Mm -hmm. People still hired the company, but they didn't care if it was my fingers touching. They love the final result. They love the images. They, that was the impact, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't go out into the world and say, hey, I outsourced my editing. You know, that's, that's, is that really important? You know, I'm not trying to submit for competition. So I'm not trying to now yeah. somebody did recently just win an international award in a photography competition with an AI image. And then they got the award taken away from them after it came out that it was an AI image. <laughs> um, so that just happened in recent time. So I think we're going to see this controversy. I just think um, when it comes to, we always, we're looking at AI as like the, 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 the that blank page syndrome. This is the first draft. Mm -hmm. Let me do this. And then from here, let me have a human being touch it to make sure it's in our voice, it's our languaging, it's our tone, it's how we would present things. Where we see a lot of people make a mistake with AI is they don't give it any input or, the, or they're very beginner on what's called the prompting, the, the prompt engineering part of it. And what you're going to see a trend and something you're going to hear more of in the future are what are called mega prompts. And that is like paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs where you go in and fill the blank, like who your avatar is, what their pain points are. It, like you're giving the AI way more context. Mm -hmm. You're talking about all the, 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 the six uh, open-ended questions, the who, where, what, how, why, what, who, then all those, uh, I just did it out of order. So I just messed it up. Okay. Uh, but, but it's just something like all, all the, all the things that, we would say in a normal interview that we would ask, well, we have to treat the AI like a human being. It doesn't have context. If, if you allow it to make things up, it will. And that's one thing that AI is not good with a lot of times is when it, in its learning, if it has a void, it will just like a human being, it will make things up. It will fill the void. So you have to fact check. It doesn't typically give you citations. Now the new versions are, are coming out. Uh, new chat versions of ChatGPT in the future, they're coming out where you can fact check. It'll go into Google. It'll look for citations. It'll give it to you. So they, they've they been hearing this stuff, but so they're answering. So that's what I'm saying. This is the in the infancy phase. So everything that we're complaining about AI, these engineers are taking that information back and they're, they're evolving and they go, oh, we heard you, no citations. Okay, let's get where the root of information is. And so we're, we're gonna see a huge amount of evolution that's gonna happen. But I think when it comes down, uh, the, the legal thing, I think it's gonna be really interesting. I think we're in future years, we're gonna have some landmark cases that are gonna set precedences as far as like, this is how, you know, in different countries, how they land on copyright and trademark and like intellectual property when it comes to AI. And then there's the element over here, where it's no matter where this is, it's like on, on the other side, it's like, how do we want to run our business? Do we need to, every single social media post and every single blog, do we need to announce to the world like, hey, I, I had help doing this, you know, type thing. I, I, there's so many best-selling authors that did not write a word of their book, you know, and they get on stages and speak and people love them and they get the transformation and, they, and, they, and they're there. How many, how many incredible singers, you know, sing on stage in and it's somebody else wrote the song, right? Now they do because that's all paid and it wasn't done by AI. They might have a credit line in a CD somewhere, but when you're still on stage, they don't say, hey, I'm about to sing a song that so-and-so wrote and so-and-so did the, the, the lyric, you know, da, da, da. like they don't get this disclaimer over and over again, you know, when, when, when they do that. Um, so I really just think it's gonna come down to your personal take as far as what you feel you're inclined to do. I don't, mm -hmm. on our end, I don't see any like moral obligation. I think it's the net result. Can we put our, can we put our signature, like we stand behind this. So that means mm -hmm. that we're going to edit. That means we're going to fact check. That means we're going to review. 
and not all the time is the first draft. Um, one of our friends, uh, Jeff Walker, he just he was talking about AI recently, um, and and he said, you know, we look at it like if you were going to write on your own, you're not a good writer. It's like you probably would get an F on this paper, you know. And then what you're going to do is you're going to feed your information into AI, and it's going to make it a C, you know. But what you're going to do is you're going to put your touch on it to make it an A. And that's really what's going to make all the difference is that that final touch that you put on there. So I think there's that element. Now, I think at that point, then copywriters and SEO experts are actually going to be a premium in the market versus being replaced because they, they, might, they might be able to save a little bit of time, energy and effort to go from that F to that C, but their, their value is going to be from taking that thing from a C to an A. Yeah, because yeah, so right now it's like more mediocre from everyone. Yeah. And if you can get mediocre really easily, then you're going to need to have a true human professional to get you up to that like top percentile. Exactly. And I am sorry to all the English teachers and like all of the professors of writing intensive courses from now until the end of the universe, because your job just got way harder. I can only imagine what all these high school and college kids are going to do with this and all of their term papers. <laughs> Cause oh. once you said citations, I was like, oh my gosh. Well, I tell you, oh, just we, wow. we think we're ahead. No, 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 no. My, my son's in high school right now. He was, I was telling him about ChatGPT and he, and he was telling me like all the kids are already on it. Like this is, and this is back in December. So ChatGPT 3.5 at that time only just released publicly at the end of November. And I thought we were on the cutting edge of it. It was like, all oh, the kids know they, they, they're already leveraging and using it. The school had already banned use of it. <laughs> that you'd be basically expelled if, if you're using it. Um, so, um, and and it's something like we we have to understand that we can we can either ride the wave or get hit by it. Mm -hmm. So we have to. It's a choice that we all make. We can either sit back and go, nope, we're going to do the old way. Just like just think of all the people that were like, oh, digital cameras. Those those are that's just a trend. Oh yeah. You know, Facebook, that's just a trend. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you know the internet thing. That's just a trend. All these flat phone things. That's just a trend. <laughs> you know. And um, so it just, it depends on, you're either gonna get in now or you're gonna get in and catch up later yeah. on. Yeah. So um, keep up. I'm sure people would love to know where they can go learn more about you online and um, maybe learn about the adaptive marketing program. And so tell them, where can they find you? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So we love all things marketing, uh, branding, positioning when it comes to selling online uh, courses, memberships, coaching programs. And who knows, you might have somebody in your audience that knows their thing really well, or maybe a family member and they want to lean in in the online opportunity. Uh, and you can find us, uh, our, our one program that we were just talking about was the online, um, actually the uh, Adaptive Marketing Program. So if you just go over to adaptivemarketingprogram.com. Uh, or any of the social media channels that are out there in the world, uh, it's at Real Paul Pruitt. Uh, then you would locate me there. Real Paul Pruitt. There you go. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I really um, enjoyed like picking your brain and, and hearing all your opinions. And I, I'm really glad that we had this talk because I'm thinking about it like I hadn't thought about it from all the perspectives that you presented it. And so it has answered a lot of questions for me. And I hope that it has... Um, answered a lot of questions for our listeners as well. So thank you everybody for listening. And until next time, go forth and market with purpose. To get a copy of the show notes and all those links that we just heard from our guest, head on over to maycreate.com, M-A-Y-E-C-R-E-A-T-E.com. And of course, I have to tell you the things that all podcasters are supposed to tell you at the end of their episodes. Like, if you thought this was awesome, you could subscribe. And then I would like get to tell you when I have new stuff for you to learn and new episodes and new people to meet, new stories to tell. Oh, and of course, I would really love it if you left a review. So head on over to maycreate.com for those show notes, M-A-Y-E. C-R-E-A-T-E dot com or maybe even contact my team about building that next website. We can do it for you and we even have our Better Than DIY website program that teaches you to plan and build your own website. So head on over to maycreate.com M-A-Y-E C-R-E-A-T-E dot com. I'll meet you over there.